Assalamu alaikum. Today we're going to discuss the procedure for lab number two. In clinic number two, which precedes this step, we had trays, special trays delivered to the clinic. On these special trays, we have performed border molding. After the border molding step, we have removed the wax, loaded the tray with zinc oxide eugenol, and then take an impression for the patient. So the resultant would be an upper and lower zinc oxide eugenol impressions. These impressions will be disinfected and will go to lab number two following a clinic number two. In lab number two, we first began by boxing the impressions. And once we finish boxing, we're going to pour these boxed impressions using a stone. And the resultant will be a cast that we will harvest from inside this boxing. So once we remove all the boxing material, we remove the impression, the attached impression, and the tray. All of that is removed. We harvest a secondary cast made of, uh, out of stone. The secondary cast might be irregular with some irregularities. Uh, the thickness might be un not uniform. And then we go and begin trimming out the cast. And what we get are the casts for second work on it. This is, we call it a secondary cast, we could call it a working cast, we could call it the master cast. So these are the casts that we will be working on from now on till the end of the denture procedure. So these are called master casts. These are made of stone and stone is hard after 24 hours and they are ready to do the other step. So we have done the f fabrication of the casts and then we're going to do wax rim production. In lab number two, we have to get from the lab the production of the record blocks and registration blocks. These are synonyms for the same term. These are composed of a base plate covering all the seat area of the denture. And over that, we have a wax block or rim that covers and mimics the area of the teeth. The function of this base plate is to be maintain this wax rim and hold it into place similar to what will be in the denture because this reproduced surface is a, a reproduction of the accurate tissue uh, profile of the patient. So the base plate reproduced over this is accurate. So once we go to clinic number three, which will be a jaw registration clinic, inside the patient's mouth, once we will be placing these base plates here, inside the patient's mouth. First of all, the base plate will be mimicking the oral tissue, so it will be fit more. And as well, it will be holding this wax rim, and this wax rim represents the teeth position. In denture fabrication, we first fabricate teeth on wax because we want it to be repairable. We want to make sure we can move teeth around. If any mistakes, we could adjust the teeth easily in wax. So it's better than putting teeth immediately into a denture to put them on something temporary. So this structure altogether is a temporary structure, which will be holding the teeth inside the patient's mouth. But before even putting the teeth into this wax rim, we need to make sure that the wax rim is compatible with the tissue, meaning that it's not interfering with the lip, it's not stretching the lip, it's not uh, under uh, supporting the lip. We want to make sure we have a good buccal corridor. We want to make sure that we for, uh, mimic the occlusal table. When, once we have also the lower inside the patient's mouth as well, we need to make sure that the lower is fitting in with the correct dimensions. We want to make sure that both are together inside the patient's mouth fit with the correct vertical dimension. Sometimes these will not be correct, so what is easy about wax rims is simply I could bring a hot plate and melt this down until I get a correct dimension. If the wax is protruding, I could reduce it. If teeth were there, it will become more difficult to move teeth. So it's easier to move the wax than to move the teeth. To fabricate record blocks, we need two parts. We need a first part, which is composed of something solid, and usually we make it out of acryl. It could be cold cure acryl or light cure acryl material or we could use shellac. This is an old material, it's called shellac base material, but it's no longer used because it's uh, fragile 
and can easily break. And sometimes while manipulating the wax and the heat and the temperature, it might warp inside the patient's mouth. So it's not very accurate, it's no longer used. But just to complete the list of materials used. Today we're going to use light cure material. For the second part, which is the wax rim, we could use wax in ready form, ready-made uh, forms. These come from uh, uh, templates like this, where you, you will be receiving as students ready-made of these. Or we can fabricate them using base plate wax. So the other material we make the solid base by is heat-cured acryl. And this heat-cured acryl will later be part of the denture. So if we use heat cure, we could uh, utilize it and add the denture teeth to it as an addition. So it doesn't become a temporary. For patients that have an allergy from acrylic material, we might even use some metal base formed on cast on the patient's uh, dimensions. So the idea is having something hard inside the patient's mouth and the soft uh, malleable part which we will be adjusting. For the first part, which is the base plate part, covering the basal seat area, it should have full border reproduction from the secondary cast, meaning that the borders in this base plate are mimicking the functional position of the borders inside the patient's mouth. So that means we can locate this in the patient's mouth and the patient could do the functional movements while still not having any uh, movement of the base plate itself. So it's fabricated according to the secondary cast and it's mimicking the denture later on. This wax is added by melting it down and binding it to the uh, base plate. So what we will get are two casts, upper and lower. And we're going to begin by drawing the outline of the outer surface of the sulcus. So we are now recording the full width of the sulcus. It's the outer line. Why do we need to draw this line? We want you to visualize that your base plate is covering the full sulcus up to this line. So this is the outer outline of the sulcus. For the lingual sulcus as well, we are concentrating on the outer line of the sulcus. Okay, so all of the sulcus is from inside of this line and will be included in the base plate once we make it. The posterior border of the base plate will reach the retromolar pad area, while in the denture it will be a bit less. So the base plate is a bit more extended on the retromolar pad area unless it's uh, interfering with the tergoid, uh, tergomandibular raphe. On the upper we're going to do the same. So this step you're going to draw the outline of the outer surface of your sulcus to make sure that the base plate is extending to those areas. On the posterior part, we're going to go and draw the line inside the hamular notch area. Okay. In the middle part, we're going to make it straight between the hamular areas because we want the base plate extended. Because later on, there is a clinical step where, we're, where we are determining the vibrating line. So we want to make sure that the base plate is covering a bit more posterior than the denture area. The denture area might be a bit anterior in this region by one or two millimeters in the post -dome area. So these are the outlines, and now we're ready to do the uh, light cure base plate. Now we're ready to do our uh, light cure base plate material. So we're going to put it over the cast and adapt it as we said in last time. We're not going to thin it. We're just going to 
adapted to the cast in a way where it is extending over the all the area drawn with the uh, pencil. We could place Vaseline on our fingers to smoothen it all around. So we're going to smooth it. And also notice that the, we are pressing it inside the sulcus. This pressure into the sulcus is squeezing the light pure material into the uh, sulcus. We're removing the excess. The excess is removed outside the land area. It's not on the line we've drawn. It's even more farther. It's on the very periphery of the cast. So we continue. And then the excess on the land area, we squeeze it into the sulcus. Okay? So the excess of the, the material on the land area of the cast, we're squeezing it now into the sulcus. So no excess is left on the land area. And now we're going to make sure that no area of the sulcus is, uh, is empty. If we find that our material is deficient, we might just add a piece, a small piece of uh, light cure and add it to the surface that we were pressing inside the sulcus if we have deficiency in material. So if we look at it from occlusally, if we look at it occlusally, you notice now that the material has filled in all of the sulcus, the land area is clear, and we have finished the material exactly on the line, the line of the sulcus we have drawn. So we can see the line from the inside. So we, that we are removing the excess from the land area and we are reaching the line that we have drawn over the sulcus. The full sulcus depth and width are inside now the base plate. We will remove the excess from all sides and then trim it posteriorly. And posteriorly, we're going to include the hamula of notches into our work. When we're removing from the posterior area, we have to make sure that the edge of the material becomes thin. And we are squeezing it back to, we're not leaving sharp angles. The idea here is that we're manipulating the light cure material in a way that we don't want to do any trimming with the bear later on. Once we have now all of the edges are clear, and uh, smooth and we are ready to light cure it just before light curing we make some indentations and rough areas because we need to make sure that the wax later on will adhere to this base plate if we place it over a smooth base plate we will have the problem that the uh, wax will detach from the base plate so we want to make sure that it goes in and adheres well so the more rough the crest of the ridge is in the base plate area, that causes it to adhere better to the uh, wax room. We could also place later on some sticky wax as well over the crest of the ridge as another method to adhering the wax to the base plate. So we just make it rough. And now we have finished it in a way that we will not need any trimming after on. So we just simply put it in the light cure and light cure it. While this is light curing, we are going to do the lower. So it's light cured for three, minute, three minutes. And now we're going to go to the lower. The lines are already drawn. So we're going to go and we adapt it in a manner that we're not thinning it. We place it on the cast. We always begin adapting from the lingual side first and then buckling. And we're trying not to thin it too much. We're adapting it well before we cut.
and now we're going to repeat the same procedure for the lower the base plate of the lower is the same as the upper except there is no lingual area so the empty area will be on the lingual where we're going to remove the excess so on the uh, outer side we just remove over the land area from the inner side on the inner side we're going to cut the lingual area the excess on the lingual area we don't cut it in the sulcus we go beyond the sulcus by three millimeter because we want this extra material to squeeze it into the sulcus so we are freeing the lingual area and then we continue the adaptation of the borders similar to what we have done in the upper After the first light cure, the material is now solid from the outside, but it might still be soft from the inside. So we need to detach the base plates from the cast, find the grip from the border, and take it out. And then we insert it once, time, once more into the light cure to do a second light cure from the inside. This will make it hard enough to withstand the pressures inside the patient's mouth. So we separate it from the cast, put, it, put the uh, fitting surface now exposed, the part close to the tissue. Now it's exposed, and we begin the light cure cycle once more. After we have light cured from the inside, we will notice that there are uh, still some sharp areas on the borders. This base plate will be placed inside the patient's mouth and we don't want to injure them. So we want to make sure that any excess that is sharp on the borders, we remove them. These are delineated by a pencil first. And now you can attach your tungsten carbide bear and remove them. So we're going to remove them by handpiece. And now we're going to use our tungsten carbide bear which is smooth and have the flutes, multiple flutes on it. We are going to attach it to their handpiece. The way we attach bears to handpieces, uh, the handpiece has two parts that rotate against each other. We place the bear and then secure it. We make sure that it's secure. It does not go out. This is very important for your safety. We hold it by a grip. It's called a finger a hand grip. And we use our other finger to secure, and we begin remove, trimming the border. To trim, we're going to utilize the control for the trimmer. We're going to use a speed three to minimize the speed of the handpiece and make it suitable. And now we're going to go around all of the border, smoothing these sharp edges. So you see that speed three is removing minimal amount of material all around. Once we finish the border, uh, all of the border 
trimming all of the border now we're ready to do the second step which is placing the wax rims the idea now we are going to discuss is where are we going to place this wax rim do we place it over the crest of the ridge do we place it more a bit labially a bit lingually do i open it do i close it meaning that the buck teeth the posterior teeth are more to the lingual or more to the buccal for to understand this issue we need first to understand how does the maxilla and mandible resorb by time to have a closer look at uh, bone resorption after extraction let us see these models these sequential models this is the case of an upper arch where all teeth are present and we have the alveolar process in between the teeth holding the teeth into place by periodontal ligaments. So these teeth are inside a socket where they are kept attached to the bone by periodontal ligaments. Now once the teeth are extracted, if we look immediately after extraction, we will find these empty holes and these are representing the area where alveolar process was holding the teeth. But now, ha having no teeth in place, we have lost the uh, stimulus for bone to stay there. So these sockets and the interceptal bone, the bone projecting in between teeth and between roots, these uh, bone projections begin to resorb. So with no stimulus, they begin to resorb and we gradually have the resorption from the projections first. So they, these projections begin to lose the structure and they begin rounding up here. The maxillar uh, tuberosity is a structure that stays in place and we have the resorption growing around them. If this continues, the f fastest resorption happens within the first six months of extraction. But then later on, we will have a round, well-developed ridge all around. And this is called the residual ridge. It's remaining after teeth have been extracted. We call it residual ridge. And this is the form immediately after extraction. Sometimes we have some undercuts here around them. But with further resorption, we begin having smaller ridges by the resorption coming from the buccal side and the labial side. This is how the maxilla resorbs. So most of the palatal side resorbs very slow, while in the buccal side, it resorbs faster. So we begin losing some of these undercuts. So where the undercut here was prominent, now it's less prominent, and we have more resorption from the buccal. The height of the ridge also becomes lower, so it becomes closer to the basal bone, and we have smaller ridges preserving the tuberosity and the incisive papilla, these two structures stay in place. More years are advancing and the patient is advancing with age, the ridge becoming smaller. We lose the buccal side. We begin losing more of the buccal side. We, the undercuts are now disappearing. The bridge is going smaller and smaller. Further resorption, oh, with bad impressions, we will get even smaller ridges. The ridge becomes so thin, sometimes we get some called knife edge ridge. More buccal resorption had happened. We could also notice that the sulcus becomes wider. So more bone from the buccal is removed, but the sulcus is in the same place, so it becomes wider from uh, outside to in. If more resorption happens, smaller and smaller ridges are there. No undercuts, we lose undercuts, we lost the height and the palate becomes shallower in comparison with the residual ridge. The two structures that don't change are the tuberosity and the incisive papilla. The tuberosity sometimes begin to suffer from the resorption and the last anatomical structure that does not change are the hamular notches. So the structures that are usually used for reference in, in resorption are the hamular notches and incisive papilla because they don't change in place. So although the incisive papilla appears more prominent, it has been present behind the teeth, okay? But because of the continuous labial resorption, now you find that the incisive papilla is over the ridge. 
Why? Because of the resorption of the labial plates of the bone. If more and more resorption happens, sometimes we even get almost flat ridges. The incisive papilla becomes, it stays prominent as it is. More and more flat ridges, the, the sulcus uh, grows wider and wider, and the palate becomes shallower in comparison with the ridges that are receding vertically closer to the palate. So if we compare this palate and this palate, this is the same patient, but notice that in comparison, we could consider this a deep palate. Here, it became shallower by the vertical resorption of the bone. If we would take area by area, we will find the patterns of resorption. So if we go and revise them, the incisor area in the anterior area, we have resorption all around, but more resorption happens labially. If we're talking about the canine area, same thing, more resorption going labially. Premolar area, resorption on both sides, but more resorption from buccally. Molar area of the upper, once more, more resorption on the buccal sides. And altogether, if we compare the, this to this, we couldn't consider that the ridge became smaller in all sizes. Smaller by the resorption happening buccally and labially. Now, further or lower, we have the same patterns of resorption, but the vertical reduction of the mandible causes the crest of the ridge coming closer to the body of the mandible. So, if we see, back, go back to the teeth, these are when the teeth were there. This is the teeth and their alveolar processes held by the alveolar bone. Once we extract the teeth, we have the alveolar processes projections. If these sharp projections begin to round up and we get more smooth residual ridge by time, but still we are in the upper part of this. If you notice just the tilt of it, it's going downwards. So this area is wider than this area. The same pattern of resorption that happens in the upper happens in the lower, but because we're moving closer to the body of the mandible, we can find that as if the ridge is becoming wider more resorption happens we get the ridge closer to the body so it appears to be wider in the buccal area the premolar area the bone is vertical in the same location so it doesn't move a lot but it becomes more round and less vertical height we lose vertical height the labial of the upper hap resorption happens labially as the upper dungeon. more resorption happens we will get this side. We will lose more of the vertical height. The structures that you notice that did not change are the retromolar pads and the lingual frenum area. These are the two structures that don't move. So in comparison with the retromolar pad, the retromolar pad was lower than the teeth position, but now it is, it's like becoming higher. It's not becoming higher. It's just that the vertical height is lost from the mandible. So we are coming closer to the wider area buccally. Premolar area, only vertical resorption. Labial area, we're coming closer to the body of the mandible. So now in this high res advanced resorption, we will be over the crest, uh, or the crest of the ridge will be over the basal bone. In very advanced resorption patterns, we will find that the ridge has no longer this well-formed vertical height. We lost undercuts. It even sometimes becomes reversed. This is called reversed ridge. It's uh, lower here. The cancellous bone has resorbed here. This is where the mental foramen sometimes is touching the crest of the ridge. Notice that the body of the mandible in the labial area, in advanced cases, it moves labially because this is where the mental process is here. So we'll see how flat the ridge becomes after resorption. So let's revise the areas. The incisor area at the early resorption stage, more labially. The canine area, we will have more labial resorption than the lingual resorption. In the premolar area, it's equal all around. 
in the molar area, it appears to be more from the lingual from the, than the buccal because we are coming closer to the base that is wider than the crest of the ridge earlier. So respecting the pattern of resorption, we need to place the wax rims on the upper a bit to the buccal side and labially than the crest of the ridge. So if we look at the cast where we're going to place the base plate, so we fabricate first the base plate. Once we want to place the wax rim, this wax rim is not placed over the crest of the ridge immediately. Okay. So we need to replace it a bit more labially and more buccally. So we're going to spread it a bit and more buccally and labially. So it's not corresponding exactly to the crest of the ridge. It's more a bit larger than the crest of the ridge. For the lower, when we're going to place the base plate, if we look at the, ba the wax rim over the base plate, the base plate is constructed in this similar manner. But once we place the wax rims, we're going to place the wax rims that the labial are a bit labial to, from canine to the canine area. These areas are placed a bit labial to, uh, to overcome or to substitute the resorption that happened here. Uh, towards the body of the mandible. The canine area and the first premolar area, they stay over the crest of the ridge, but the lingual areas, we're going to place them a bit more lingually because the original position of the teeth were a bit more lingually. So this is how we place the wax rim over the base plate. Now we are at the step where we're going to add the wax rim over the base plate. But we might have a problem, which is the adhering of the wax, because we had Vaseline when we were fabricating the base plate. So it's better uh, first either not to place Vaseline on the crest of the ridge, or if there is some Vaseline, we can, uh, we can remove it. Now we want to make sure that the surface is free from any Vaseline, the crest of the ridge is free from any Vaseline. So we just pass it by the flame, just to thin it and make it warm. And then we wipe away any remnants of Vaseline before adding any of wax to it. So it should be totally adherent to the base plate. So for the lower, we're going to do the same thing. Just wipe away the Vaseline. If we have not placed Vaseline, we will have the problem of uh, air inhibited layer of light cure acrylic material. So it will not totally uh, cure. So we need to wipe away the Vaseline we placed, and now we're ready to attach the wax rim. The wax rim we, you will get is a ready-made wax rim. So it is prefer, uh, made or performed uh, according to the dimensions we want. We will talk about them in a moment. But the idea is it has a flat surface with the correct dimensions, and the cross-section is square shape, while in the other it's very irregular. This is the one we're going to adhere to the cast while we will maintain the measurements around here. The measurements on this side are around uh, 8 to 10 millimeters in the molar area. In the canine or premolar area are 6 to 8. And in the anterior area, these are 3 to 5 millimeters. The height of it is at least 8 millimeters. So we don't want to change this, these dimensions. So we keep this surface. And we're going to adhere this lower surface to this crest of the ridge in this area where that we have roughened and removed Vaseline. But now this the question is, where do we place it? Do we place it here? Do we place it here? Do we go inside? Do we nar keep it narrow? Do we need to widen it? This, to answer this, we need to understand the pattern of resorption. As we have said in the f earlier videos, that in for the maxilla, the pattern of resorption is all together the ridge will become smaller and maybe thinner and narrower. But the net crest of the ridge will go smaller because there is more resorption from the outside than the palatal compact bone on the inside. So the rate of the resorption from the outside is larger. That means the crest of the ridge here, 
after the resorption, especially after 10 or 15 years uh, extraction, is not the same location where it w began with in the re recent extraction patients. So that means this ridge is smaller than what is, uh, it was originally. And if I place the teeth out like this, you will see that we're encroaching on the tank space, and this tank space will not have enough space for it. So we need to place the teeth in their original position. So the original position is not over the crest of the ridge immediately. The original position for the upper are a bit more buccal uh, than the crest of the ridge on the molar area. So we just w we're using this warm uh, rim. We have made it warm a bit. And we simply widen it until we, when we look at it in a cross section, the cri this center of this wax is a bit more buccal than the crest of the ridge. So it's more buccal here and more buccal. Now we can look at the position from the posterior. We can find that the midline of the rim is a bit towards the buccal. So it's not over the crest of the ridge immediately. It's more towards the buccal from the, uh, the, the both posterior ends. As well, that um, wax rim should not be extending over the maxillary tuberosity area. Now, anteriorly, do I place it on the crest of the ridge? Do I place it more anterior, more posterior? The pattern of resorption in the anterior area is from the outside in. So we need to make the wax rim back into the original location where teeth were present, and that's slightly more labially. So if I, if I look at it vertically, what I should see I should see an equal margin of the blue light cure material just over and around the new position of the wax rim. So the wax rim is not going beyond the base plate. We're not even going beyond the middle of the sulcus. We're still confined in the sulcus, but a bit more labial on th from the crest of the ridge uh, in the anterior area, and a bit more buccal than the crest of the ridge in the posterior area. And this is the final location we will fix the wax rim on the base plate at. So now that we decided its location over the crest of the ridge, we need to seal it to the base plate. So we need to begin first adapting it to the, to the uh, base plate and then we begin adding molten wax from another source. We just bring some molten wax and we begin adding it in between the spaces, the empty spaces between it and the base plate. We're going to begin from the lingual side first, taking some molten wax and dripping that molten wax in between the base plate and the wax rim. So it will act as a glue. What happens with wax when you heat it, the bees wax part of it, which is the most sticky component, it's, it is uh, with low density. So it goes to the surface. And it uh, is responsible for the adherence of wax to other surf dry surfaces. You can see it more clearly on the buckle. We wait for it to dry. So we're as if we're doing some glue all around, filling in the spaces and adding just enough to stick it into place. But then these large voids or there, these large spaces, we will be filling it with other wax. So we're just melting the surface. We try not to change the body of the wax rim because the body of the wax rim is made to the dimensions we have talked about, according to the dimensions. So we don't want to melt from the body of the wax. We're just melting from the base of it. So this is maintained. You can notice that the dimensions and the square shape cross section is maintained. We're not touching that part. Okay? So it's now in fixed in location. Now we're ready to bring in a small strip of wax and fill in the spaces. We're going to heat it until it's very warm and squeeze it into the empty spaces after we have fixed the upper wax rim. So this heating here, we're going to heat it until it becomes very soft and playable. Okay, you can see how playable it is. 
and we're going to make sure that all of it is very soft all around. We're going to make it in a roll form. We're going to heat it once more. Make sure it's shiny when, when we're adding it. So molding it, then we make the surface shiny and dripping on the surface. Why? Because this is the consistency that will stick to, to the old wax we have. So what we're going to do is squeezing it into location. It's become very soft. It had become very soft. It filled in the gaps. We want to maintain the body of the wax and we're not going to change. So we're filling in. And then we're going to, after pressing it into location, melt it down and fuse further the wax rim with the body of the tray. So. And making the junction between the wax and the place, base plate well fused together as if they are in, made of one block. While we're working with the base plate, it is why sometimes to take it off once it's uh, firmly attached, take it off the cast because we want, don't want the wax dripping on the cast. That's for one. And secondly, any wax going in the fitting surface, this will not fit into its location. So we want to make sure that we, uh, the wax drips away, not to the fitting surface. If I need more wax, if there's a gap like this one, yes, I can bring some new wax. And filling in the spaces where I had uh, deficiencies. Try not to touch the body of the wax rim on the upper side. The, the little curve we have on the end of the wax knife helps us in this function. So we have fused now the outer side. Now we're going to go in and fuse the inner side after we finish. So adding more wax wherever there are spaces. And here you could see the pinkish color of molten wax. And on the other side now, it's totally fused. We're filling in gaps, more gaps. And we're going now to the lingual side. Now we're maintaining the body of the wax rim totally untouched. We're going to go now into the lingual side. Once more, we're going to take out a strip of material and push it into location. So we're going to fill in the lingual side. So we added a strip of wax. We're rolling it into a small form, circular, and extended. We're going to make it a bit warm, thin it more. And then, once it's totally warm and playable, we're going to heat it for the last time and let it drip because we need it to make it drip. So once it's fit and we have checked its length, now it's ready to be attached. So we just finally heat it until the surface is dripping and we squeeze it into location. Okay, we squeeze it into location, filling in all the gaps. We're using the internal heat to squeeze it into the gaps and then we're going to use the hot wax knife and the curved end of the wax knife to melt it down and fuse the border once more. Notice that if any wax is dripping, we leave it to drip away from the base plate and not onto the fitting surface. We keep it on the polished surface.
And once we're finished, we clear the pellet area from all excess wax. Now we're going to remove the excess of the material. We're going to smoothen the surfaces using the lacron carver. So for this step now, which is the removing the excess and, and uh, smoothing the surface, we need a sharp lacron carver. And we're going to scrape away any irregularities in the surface. We want to make it totally smooth before we do the final shine to the surface. Okay. The wax rim, as you can see, buckley is extending over the buckle wall, but lingually, we clear the wax from the palatal surface totally, as we have cleaned it in the when we, once we added it. We want to make sure that no wax is present palatally at all. The fitting surface should be also clean as well. So now we're going to the borders are also totally clean of wax. And now we're going to just scrape away the surface, make sure that any irregular, gross irregularities in the surface are smoothened before we do the final uh, pass over the flame or uh, brush of flame on the borders to make it totally smooth. And notice that the uh, dimensions are now the same as the original wax rim. We just filled in the gaps in between the wax rim and the base plate. So once it's smooth, no gross irregularities are seen. It's almost uh, leveled all together. We can now pa then pass it on the flame quickly. So we're going to use the small flame for this purpose. So you're going to put on your small flame and just pass by all of the surface just to give it the final shine. So it's not, this step is not done before uh, the scraping. It's very important to do it after all major discrepancies or changes are all done. And this is the final record block. And if we place it on the cast and also take another vertical view of it you can see okay you can see the wax rim is located a bit more to the buckle if we look at it from the uh, behind okay you can see the bevel clearly and if we look from the back view we can see that the wax rim is slightly more buckle than the crest of the ridge if we look at it labially labially you can see the labial inclination of the wax rim because lab upper labial teeth are inclined uh, anteriorly so all of these features are maintained the dimensions of the wax rim are maintained and once your wax rim is ready for delivery make sure that you write down your name clearly your university number clearly your group number and your seat number we're going to go for the final shine where we pass it by the flame just before delivery we'll pass it by the flame and then with the wet goes with soap pass it over the surface and this will maintain this final shine over the surface and this is now ready for delivery Assalamu alaikum. Today we are going to fabricate the lower record block. You will be receiving a wax rim, a ready made wax rim, as this one, and it has uh, pre measured uh, measurements for the width of the wax. So, anteriorly in the incisor area, it is around 3 to 5 millimeter wide. At the canine area, 
it is five to seven millimeters, and in the molar area is around eight to 10 millimeters wide. This wax rim will be fixed over the base plate, respecting the pattern of resorption that happens in the lower. So if I, like, uh, if I take, for example, uh, this posterior view to it, you will notice that we're going to place the wax rim slightly, the middle of the wax rim is slightly to the lingual to compensate for the shrinkage that happened in the uh, mandible going towards the body of the mandible. Anteriorly, it will be placed a bit labial to the crest of the ridge, and it will be uh, altogether parallel to the floor. If you're going to place the block immediately as it is, as you have receive it, you will have a large space between it and the cast. So what we're going to do is trying to adapt this wax rim to the uh, ridge. So we're going to try to trim slightly from the fitting surface of it that fits over the base plate. So the area we are keeping, the area that we are keeping is the pre-measured area. We are working on the fitting surface and we're reducing the thickness. We're making like a bevel posteriorly. So you could notice now we have this bevel. Okay. And we will have, now we could fit it on the cast and we find that it becomes closer and the gap between the wax and the ridge is less. And we might sometimes need to reduce a bit from its length posteriorly if it becomes too long. So we fix it into position. Now it's, very, it's closer than it was. And we're going to fix it into position according the direction. So we're going to fix it in the same way we did with the upper. First of all, we're going to melt some wax and glue the wax rim to the base plate, just, just trying to initially fix it. Notice that we're not touching the pre-measured area because we want to keep the cross section of this wax rim occlusally. All of our work is towards the gingival side of this wax rim. This is the same we did with the upper. We adapt the other side as close as possible to the ridge. And then we begin adding wax in between, melting the wax to act as glue in between the layers. And once it's ready, we can now fill in the empty spaces using the wax as we have done last time. Once it's fixed to the base plate, we have these empty triangles. We don't want to use the wax from the wax rim. We simply want to fill in from the outside some more wax. So as we did in the upper, we're going to take a strip of wax, a small strip of wax, For you as students, you can use a smaller sections if it is a bit difficult to, for you to manage a long strip. You can do it in sections. We're heating it, first to mold it in a roll form. And then once we have the uh, uniform morphology of this box sheet, we're going to make it a drip, roll it well, and then make it a drip to go into the empty spaces. When we fix it into location, 
We just make sure that we are out of the cast now. We're not uh, using the cast. And any wax that is dripping, we try to control it that doesn't go to the fitting surface. If wax, molten wax, goes to the fitting surface, we will have the problem of uh, non-fitting of the base plate back into the cast. Notice also that while we're melting, we're trying to avoid the upper half of the wax rim as much as possible, maintaining the occlusal morphology, the square shape of occlusal morphology. And we continue to the other side. Once more, making sure nothing goes to the fitting surface. It all drips from the sides, from the back side of the wax rim. The upper half of the wax rim will try to maintain its measurements. And we're going all around. Trying to also smooth the surface as well while we're going. And excess is removed or allowed to drip. And then we're continuing filling in the gap. So we'll have a smooth curve, polished surface curve on the side. Filling in all gaps. And we make it smooth using the hot instrument. We're going to repeat this work on the, ling the lingual side as well. Smoothing, analyzing, maintaining the closure table as it is. And we're going to repeat now for the lingual side. So we have it in a roll form. We're going to give it the final heat and begin adding it, filling in the gaps, squeezing it into place, trying not to shift. We try not to shift the wax rim position. Cut an excess, any excess. So we have filled in all the gaps. We're waiting for it to dry a bit or cool down so we could scratch away the irregularities. Any empty gaps are filled in. And now after it cooled down from the outside, we're going to use a sharp lacquer carver to trim in away any irregularities, gross irregularities on the surface.
and we're going to repeat it from the lingual side and now we are carving from the lingual side all the way around removing excess wax and making sure also that the fitting surface is totally clear of wax now we are going to begin the final polish of the work so using the small flame if you can control with a large flame we just simply make it shiny after we have removed all gross irregularities from the outer and the inner side so it's shining now and we're going to wipe it with uh, water and soap with a gauze and we're going to wipe away and this will smooth the warm wax around its position and now it's ready to submit to the lab so finally you will have your wax shining as it is and you will notice that the location of the wax rim lingually is a bit towards the lingual so you can see that the middle of the wax rim is tilted slightly uh, oh, more lingual than the crest of the ridge it, buckly, it's free the buckle shelf area is smooth and free and you can see the labial inclination of the anterior teeth replacing the resorption labial for the lower other than the measurements we took in the beginning which are the measurements at the molar area the canine area and the incisal area we need also to make sure the height is suitable for the lower there is no specific height it depends on the morphology of the patient's mouth so suppose this is the case where we have the lower for the morphology of the residual ridge the, for this cast for example we aim to make an ideal cast which has the ridge parallel to the floor so if we look at this ridge from both sides the average length of it we're not talking about we are excluding the retromolar pad area because the retromolar pad area is ascending on the ramus of the mandible so we're excluding this so taking the average uh, direction of the ridge residual ridge in the molar areas when we construct the uh, base the uh, cast should be parallel to the floor so if the cast is correct once we place the wax rim the wax rim also should be parallel to the floor in this direction okay but there is a third determinant for the height of the uh, wax rim which is the distance between of the wax rim occlusal table of the wax rim with the retromolar pad area so if I take out this so this is the retromolar pad area so if I draw the retromolar pad out so you could uh, I would outline it so you could see it in the cast so this retromolar pad area uh, the occlusal table is best located at the middle of this area so I'm going to try to not make the height of the wax rim more than this so I'm putting an external reference line parallel to this once I place the base plate wax back I want to make sure the height of this wax is with this line over here so for this side I'm going to repeat it so once more on the retromolar pad area we're going to outline first the retromolar pad then we're going to try to half it with this line and draw an external line ref uh, getting reference from this midway of the retromolar pad and now we're going to reduce the height of the wax rim using a hot plate 